enemy artillery fire becoming more intense. The guns were firing from Karema Channel, Nagakusa Bay, Sherry Line. Uh, they were coming in all directions. There was no dead angles. See, they could tell where your artillery is because it's always in a straight line, and uh -huh. they can shoot back at you. But they put in here, it was, I was uh, the uh, operations officer for 24th Corps uh, artillery, and uh -huh. we had three battalions of Japanese attached to us. And I mean, uh, three battalions of Marines attached to our three battalions of 155s. And the colonel put me on nights by myself. There's no action in the daytime. Mm -hmm. The Japanese are in the caves in the day, 65 feet below the ground. Mm -hmm. Nothing can touch them. Mm -hmm. you know, the big battleships couldn't even touch them. But they didn't know that until I read it in here. And uh, they got flushed out of the, they, we had a monsoon. They got flushed out of the, cave, uh, the, uh, the tunnels and caves and everything because they filled with water. And it just so happened I was on nights and uh, they were planning a strategic withdrawal because uh, they were out in the open then mm -hmm. and they had to find another place. Uh, so uh, they uh, had their, all their infantry ready and they had the uh, 7th Regiment uh, artillery ready for the, uh, to throw some fire to, to make it look like they were attacking. Mm -hmm. When I'm, a, I'm on nights and the Japanese artillery starts to fire and uh, I, I called, uh, just me and a telephone operator. The colonel and his staff were all on days. So uh, I said to the operator, ring up uh, the observation battalion. Uh, they were attached to us, and uh, he did. And I said, would you give me the coordinates for the, art, the Japanese artillery that's firing right now? And uh, then I said, all right, to the operator, Ring up the six battalions, all on a, one line. Got them in there, it says, fire, uh, fire mission, uh, group five volleys, center range, time on target. Uh, shell HE, 5% white phosphorus, 5% delay fuse. Coordinates will follow, mark time. 20 minutes, time on target. I can, uh, 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, one, mark. And they just sit back. The uh, coordinates come in, and down they went, and they just waited 20 minutes I, I gave them to set up. And I just sat there, and then all of a sudden, shoo, shoo, all coming from different directions, because they're all battalions. They're scattered, mm -hmm. see? And that's why I know this was the shot that I, uh, I fired, because they said they were coming from different directions. And they all came in on that 7th Regiment. Vroom! In a minute and a half, 360 rounds hit them. All quiet the rest of the night. There wasn't a shot fired anywhere. The next day, uh, I'm just sitting around, and one of the uh, listening men said, did you hear what's happening? I says, no. Why, the Japanese are giving up and they're coming back through the lines and they want to see our machine gun artillery. <laughs> <laughs> machine gun artillery, they couldn't believe. And, uh, and in here, it's, it, it, this man describes it, he said, it, he didn't say it being machine gun artillery, it's these people coming back. Mm -hmm. But the shots are coming from all different directions because our battalions were scattered uh, around. They weren't all together. And you know, when they came, and hit the target, they're coming in this way, they're coming in this way at the target, and, and, and hitting it. That was the end of, war, the, end of the war. Huh. 20, uh, I think it was the 27th or 21st of uh, July. It was over with. And I didn't know it until I read, <laughs> until I read this story. This is very interesting to read uh, if you ever get a chance. Okay, I've, I've seen that. But I, I noticed that that was just out in the in the bookstore. So you saw that, okay? Yeah. The uh, the bad feature about it is not continuous. It's uh, it's resumes from the different units, so it, it bounces back and uh, forth in in its uh, scenario. Uh, the uh, like fare, farewell to Shuri. That's when they they decided to leave after the. 
bombardment and the water filled up the caves that they were out. So that, that's where they were, down on the ground, 65 feet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's, uh, that doesn't show any war pictures. And, and I got some picture, I got some stuff in there I got from Jack Barton. They didn't touch them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why I know they're in my, into my files. And, and, <laughs> and my, I had some nice pictures. Uh, I, I, I just apparently uh, tore my house apart trying to find them. Then I said, oh, them gosh, they kids of mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start uh, with some very informal questions, a little bit about yourself, and then uh, I want you to do most of the talking, just like you've been doing, yeah. because this is going to be your story. Uh, so uh, this is inter an interview with William Cochran. Uh, at the Connecticut Street Armory in Buffalo, New York. It is Wednesday, June 12, 2002, 1 p.m. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Um, could you tell me, sir, uh, yes. I know I just said it, but your full name and when and where you were born, please. Uh, William K. Corcoran. Uh, I was born in Buffalo, New York on December 3rd, 1915. What was your uh, pre-war education? Uh, I had a great school in high school, and I had two years of college when I was called into service, and I didn't go back to college afterwards because I got married. Okay, did you work at all before you went into military service? Oh, yes, I worked at Bethlehem Steel for 42 years altogether. Mm -hmm. Take out five years of World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, that would uh, reduce the time I was in there. Now, you enlisted in 1931? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, could you tell us about... I was 15 years old. 15 years old. Yeah, do you know why? It was during the Depression, and they took anybody. Of course, I was pretty tall at that time. I never got any taller after that. But uh, the, the sad part of it was uh, they paid $1 a day for drills. And it's during the Depression now, mind you. So after I got in there, I spent the first three years as a private, and went, oh, God, I... I learned an awful lot there when I was 15 years old with some of those guys that were tougher than anything. And, uh, but I, I just mind my own business. They didn't pay any attention to me much or anything. And, and I, I think I was a PFC after that. The, the uh, or officers didn't pay much attention to the men. But during the uh, Depression years, uh, I joined that to get some extra money because my dad uh, died in an accident. I, I had five brothers and a sister. So uh, I worked on a golf course and I, I worked, uh, uh, I joined the National Guard and then uh, and I, I worked for Bethlehem Steel. So uh, I was pretty busy and uh, in 19, in the, when I first got in there and it went through the time, I studied and uh, I learned everything I could about the military so I could advance. After the first year, I found they only paid me for one-third of the drills. Uh, instead of me getting $48 for the whole year, I only got a third of that. And I had to buy shoes with it, some boots we had. So it, it was a, a pretty much of a waste as far as money, getting money is concerned. When it came for me to re us after a year and I'm only a PFC, I was going to get out and the commanding officer says, I'll give you a promotion. <laughs> it's going to make me a corporal. And boy, from there on, I went up like the ladder and I became the first sergeant. And the only reason I became first sergeant is they came around to the federal inspection and the uh, regular army officer went through his whole outfit asking all the men questions, everybody questions and everything. But finally, he didn't ask me any questions. So finally he stopped, he says to the CO, he says, is there anybody in your outfit that knows anything? <laughs> I can still hear him saying that. He says, you might, you might talk to uh, Corporal Corker in there. So he goes over and gets me aside. And he gets a naming circle. And he says, what's this part, this part? I described every part of it. How do you set it up? How do you move it? He went from one thing to another. I guess we sat there for about a Half an hour, three quarters of an hour, he's asking me questions. I'm answering all his questions. Turned around and he said, uh, Captain Von Dack, he says, you don't even know anything about your men. 
<laughs> Here's a man, the only man in the outfit, and that went through the door, that knows anything. So I ended up to be first sergeant, just like that, from a BFC. And uh, I learned enough. So how old were you when you were first sergeant? Oh, uh, I'd say 15, 16, 17, uh, about, about 20, about that time. I was 15 when I joined, mm -hmm. Mr. Reed's era out of that. And, uh, but uh, it was exciting after that. I, I studied then and became an officer in 1937. And uh, I, I had quite an experience in World War II. Uh, we went down to Alabama, and the first thing they did, they put me in charge of the training cadre to train all of the brand new recruits that came in. And there was a bunch of officers came from the 101st Regiment and uh, the elite regiment in uh, New York City. And uh, I had to teach them about uh, field artillery. Then I took them out and had them uh, run problems and fire, do firing and things. In the meantime, then they, after that, they put me down tra training all the recruits that come in. So uh, what was happening was that I, I went in there as a second lieutenant, and all the people from World War II were all uh, majors, lieutenant colonels, and so we had a regiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all the high rank, and they were holding all those jobs, and, and the battery commanders were from uh, World War II. They were captains. You couldn't get anything. So uh, it was very slow and, and, and uh, moving up in the ranks uh, I, from that. But I still uh, took all the courses, uh, the 10 series, the 20 series, and the 30 series for promotions uh, uh, from can there. I, can I go back for one second? Uh, can, what happened when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Where were you and, and oh, good. what was your reaction to that? I. Uh, was on the Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana maneuvers uh, in 1941. And uh, around September, I think it was about September, uh, the regimental commander sent me to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the field artillery school. Uh, he didn't have any spots for me in the regiment, so he, he sent me out to school for three months. So I, uh, I was at Fort Sill when Pearl Harbor happened. I had my wife with me too, and uh, it was quite a shock when I, uh, I heard that uh, what had taken place. So overnight, they moved the whole 27th Division on three railroad trains across the United States. Twenty, twelve hours they were in California, and I'm still at the school. So they let me complete the school up until the end was uh, January, uh, December 21st. And then I returned to California to uh, Fort to uh, Fort McClellan because I didn't know where they were, and I needed transportation. So uh, I took my wife back home. I went down to Fort McClellan, got travel orders, and a ticket on the train, and they told me to, to go to Riverside, California. So I ended up in R Riverside, and uh, the sad part was. Uh, we were supposed to go to the Philippines. No, the good part. <laughs> we're supposed to go to the Philippines, and they, we couldn't. <laughs> there was no ships in the Pacific. They were all in the Atlantic. <laughs> so they sent us up to Fort Ord, California, uh, for training up there, and until uh, they could, got some ships to take us uh, to. In the meantime, the Philippines uh, was taken over, and we were able to get out by April of uh, 1940, that would have been 42, I think. Uh, and they had a dump us in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So in Hawaii, is that my resume? Yes, sir. Did, what, I mailed it to you? Yes. Am I, uh, oh yeah, I think I brought one along too. Oh, very good. I don't, I don't remember mailing that to you. Okay. So, uh, my first job there, uh, well, I, I was raised to a first lieutenant back in uh, Alabama. So my first job was an assignment of uh, making the maps and surveying for our office were scattered around the, all the islands there. And uh, from there, 
uh, we moved over to uh, Oahu to, uh, and when we got to Oahu, uh, we set up defenses, the our artillery did. And uh, our guns were uh, at Makahilo Ridge, 106 Field Artillery. And the uh, Hawaiian Department used to come down and, and uh, test fire us at times. And uh, uh, I don't remember now exactly when we, uh, we boarded ship to go. Oh, they transferred me from the 106th to the 105th Field Artillery. Uh, I was operations officer at the time at the, with the 105th, uh, I mean the 106th, so they transferred me to the 105th. I don't know why they transferred it. At first, I didn't know why. <laughs> the, the S3 of the 105th parents died, and he had to go home. And uh, so I was S3, and I find out I'm going to battle at Macon Island with the 105th Field Artillery. And my out was still here in, in, in uh, Oahu. So I hit, my, I hit the first battle of the Pacific. It was on Macon Island and Turabo. So I aboard ship, and, uh, and I think that was the, uh, what was the, the Pierce. Aboard ship, we had a uh, 610 radio, or listening to the Marines landing at Tarawa. And uh, they were going ashore. 12, they were in the boats at first, and the tide was going out. Big mistake that the Navy and everybody made. They hit the reef with the, the boats, and the men dis disembarked, and no pre-firing of the island, and they started ashore. I'm, I'm listening on a 610 radio. I'd never been in battle before. 1,200 men being mowed down, walking ashore against the Japanese fire. They were waiting for them, and the only reason they didn't bombard the island, they said, they didn't want to, they wanted to surprise the Japanese. This is the Marine Corps. They wanted to surprise the Japanese. But surprise them, we had about 15 ships out there parked. So there was no surprise. And uh, I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm going to go in Macon. Well, who did they call but my name first to go over the side and go down the net at Macon Island? In the meantime, we had scheduled, this is the Army now, not the Marine Corps or the Navy. We scheduled a bombardment of the island of... Uh, uh, Macon uh, by the uh, Air Force, uh, the Naval Air Force, uh, aircraft carrier Alaska Bay. Harry went back and forth and just raked it with bombs and everything. And I still was scared going over the side. I get in the landing craft and find out that we were the first landing craft, but there was nine more, more of them following me. We were all going in together. So we start circling, going around, and first one by one, all the fellows that were in the boat with me were starting to throw up. <laughs> the boat was going up and down, and the smell was so bad. I got so sick, I couldn't wait till I hit the beach. I just said, yes, that is truth. I didn't care about bullets or anything. That's how sick I was. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, a funny part of the, of the story is that, is, uh, forget about getting shot, but get me off out of this boat. <laughs> and uh, so when I got on the island, uh, being an operations officer, uh, I ran into some problems which I couldn't solve right away. Uh, first of all, it was below the equator. And uh, so I, I started registering the guns, uh, the firing batteries, the three of them landed. And they quit, the forward observer couldn't find the, gun, the shells lit where they were landing. And I'm using this map uh, of uh, Macon Island, which was uh, made up by the Navy. I don't know whether uh, the needle paint points in a different direction when you're below the equator, does it? I still don't know. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, but at any rate, uh, maybe they made a mistake down there and lay in the battery. and. Uh, so lo and behold, I get a, a radio announcement in from the Navy. They were in the bay, and they said, there's some artillery shots landing near our destroyer. <laughs> so right away, I knew where I was at. And I switched, I switched the guns around, 
just to write them out. Uh, and there I had it right in front of Lieutenant Trippy, and there, the shots were coming down in front of him then. And uh, so uh, we cleaned up that island in three days. Uh, and I think there was only one thing that uh, uh, I remember that hit me real hard. Colonel Conroy uh, jumped up on the top of a tank because all the men stopped at a, a, a trench. And uh, there was somebody firing, and they didn't know where they were firing from. They just stopped. And, and so he jumps up on top of this tank. You son of a bitch, come on and go, you know. And just as soon as he said that, got a bullet right to the, the center of his head. Jap was tied up on a coconut tree. And, it, and then when they saw him up there, they just machine gunned him down. But that's where they uh, got the shot from. But you know, from man to man to man, that went around the island. For, this is the fighting 69th. They went around the island all the way back to my command post and everything. That Colonel Conroy was just killed. He was the first, no, he was the second one. The guy next door in the boat next to me got killed. Uh, we hit the beach and everybody was standing with their guns ready in front of them. And a man had his finger in the trigger and the boat hit the beach and went forward. He pulled the trigger, pulled it up through the back of the head of the man in front of him. And the boat next to me, and they drag him out and lay him on the beach. And I, I still remember that. And, uh, and it was but our own men, first man killed going in the landing. But the bombardment uh, saved us where the Marine Corps should have bombarded the, uh, for their landing. So we went back to Hawaii after that operation after three days. In the meantime, a Jap sunk a Jap sunk, uh, submarine, fired a torpedo, and broke the uh, Luscombe Bay aircraft carrier in half. 800 men lost their lives. And guess what happened? 200 men came aboard our ship all covered with oil. The one part of the ship went right down immediately when it went hit. And these fellows were saying, gee, the, way the, the flames were going up at the, at the end of the sh uh, ship, uh, the one, the uh, catwalk you go out through there. We walked along and the guy said, shut the door, the smoke, you're letting the smoke in. And they, he wanted to get out of there. And he ran and he took a jump right through the flames. He didn't care what it was on the other side. And lo and behold, there was nothing and he landed in the ocean. <laughs> and uh, so he t told us this story. And these 12, these men, 1,200 men, they stayed with that and they went down with the, finally went down. And it was never announced uh, anywhere in the news, and I don't think it's ever been announced today that the Luscombe Bay was hit and broken half. At 1,200 men, uh, or 800 men out of the 1,200 were lost. So we went back to Oahu, and uh, from there, we went through, through training. Am I going too long? No. We went this through training. This is as long as you want it to be, sir. Huh? This is as long as you want it to be. Oh. So, uh, we get back to uh, Oahu and we start training again. And uh, part of our division went to Kwajalein then. We didn't go because we'd already been on uh, operation with the Fighting 69th. And uh, we were preparing for uh, Mariana, Saipan, and Tinian. In the meantime, uh, while we were on Oahu, uh, our the, the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, as you remember, but they only sunk one ship, the Arizona. The rest of them were damaged, and the Pennsylvania was laying it on its side. So when we got there, they, re, uh, they put, hung uh, concrete on the side of it to get it level, and they took all those battleships back to San Diego and repaired them. The only one they couldn't do was with the uh, Arizona. And the surprising thing was, the Japanese didn't hit a single drop of anything in Honolulu. Any of the civilians didn't get. Why? They were all Japanese. <laughs> That's what I figure. Uh, but uh, they didn't destroy anything else. They machine gunned uh, Schofield Barracks. It's still the same one. The machine gun uh, Hickam Air Force Base quarters, they're still there. The hangars are still there. The only, the big damage was on Ford Island, where the hangar was blown up there. 
they hit Canioli Marine Base, uh, only the machine gunning, but the they didn't they didn't destroy anything else on the island. And uh, we went into all these other islands, and I was very surprised how we leveled all the cities and everything on Saipan, uh, Sharon Cano. They just the Navy just uh, bulldozed everything right down. So uh, the because uh, I think the Japanese were getting the messages. The other thing was at Pearl Harbor, they were expecting them to come in from the west, and they came in from the north. And uh, here's a, uh, something that a lot of people don't know, and uh, I, I think today they, they still don't know. The Japanese were planning this operation for one full year before they attacked. Would you believe that? They went up to North Honshu, and they had set up a, a, an island up there, everything to look like Pearl Harbor. And they sent the crews up there in small amounts so nobody ever knows it. Of course, you didn't have airplanes flying over and sending a message back or anything, so nobody, nothing got out. They planned that whole tack up there, and then they loaded up in ships, and they came down through the Central Pacific at about 12 miles an hour. I think that's a little fast, because they took two tankers with them, and they were down level with the water with fuel because so, they couldn't make that whole trip uh, without having the fuel. And uh, so they had to go as slow as they were. And then they stopped, I don't remember how many, uh, maybe 100 miles north of uh, Honolulu, north of Oahu, and they came down through the center of the island and spread out and around and hit. But the whole thing was planned a whole year before it happened. And uh, Roosevelt and everybody were down in Washington uh, uh, with the diplomats and everything, and they were always blamed that he started, but he didn't. They did, they they had a plan uh, that long a, a time. Now I go back to uh, that was Pearl Harbor. Uh, go back to uh, where we going down to Saipan and Tinian. So we low big a big convoy. We went in there at. You know, like there's a, some maps in there. Of, that's this is Saipan. This is a this is a uh, they, where they committed suicide. All the people they dropped jumped off of here because the Japanese told all the people that they would get killed anyway. Now this is going down through the island. Uh, now we're down. Mount Tapacho is right about here. Uh, there's Mount Tapacho. This is all uh, Sharon Kanoa uh, uh, houses and things. And uh, that's Mount Tapacho. And this is Magazine Bay over here. So our forces landed right through here. And uh, the uh, Second Marines, I think, they stopped about here. They didn't go any further. The Fourth Marines went in. Then the 27th Division followed them and spread out to the south. Now, I have a map in there to show you how the, the operation went uh, in those. Uh, here you can see Magazine Bay, and you can see where we came through the opening in here. Uh, but it's better to look at the map in the hour. Now, um you mentioned before how who took these photographs that you have here. The well, it's right on the. It's right on the uh, right here. The York, oh, okay, from York, the York the Yorktown aircraft carrier Yorktown. before the battle. Uh, they were taken on the 23rd of February, 1944, at 2:30 in the uh, October 20, uh, 2000. Well, no, I, I, oh, 2000 feet. Saipan. Uh, Conference Prusik. Uh, this this is just a Saipan. Uh, there's, a, there's the map. There's the map there. That's the only thing I got. I can't even find my original picture. And I I got my original out, to, and that appeared in the paper in November. If they cleaned me out. <laughs>
Okay. This is Magazine Bay. All of our forces were over here. They landed here uh, at Sharon, Sharon Kanoa. And uh, this, it would, they didn't go down there yet. The uh, second Marines went well, here. So it shows the Japanese here. Uh, and the uh, third Marines crossed the island here. The 27th Division came in and come down in here. There's a map in there. It shows the front lines, everything. And uh, this is where, this, you can see here how our forces uh, came in and went down through here. And then out and took the whole island. Can you see that? Yep. Got the whole thing. Okay. Well, see, there's a lot of uh, information on here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to get a copy of this thing, I think it says on here where you can send. Oh, well, we can read that and find out later then. Let me get that uh, the map that uh, of the operation. Oh, that's. Uh, I'll go over those afterwards. Those are. Uh, here is a uh, copy of my Bronze Star Medal that I got. They can keep that. And this citation is when I retired. Now, when did you receive the Bram Star? I, I, it was pinned on me on the island of Saipan after the Battle of Tinian. It was given to me because I uh, flew a plane. I'll describe that to you in a minute. Okay. This here is a, probably the same thing you already have. Uh, when I first went in the service, uh, Trent, uh, the main thing about an officer is, the important thing is transportation, communication, and firepower. It's still that same thing where they import. Missing any one of those items, your, your operation won't uh, succeed. Also, when you're going, in, when you get into battle, reconnaissance, selection, and occupation of position. You go to a, the colonel takes his uh, battery commanders and he goes around and he finds out where he's going to put those batteries. That's called a reconnaissance. Then he comes back and they take over and they take their uh, uh, batteries up and put them in position. Gen General, down in the, uh, before we went to Pearl Harbor, General Patton started in a small tank unit on the uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, maneuvers. He was riding around there. I think we had about seven tanks. He's standing up in me. All he's doing is creating a lot of dust. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was during June, July of August of uh, 41. Now, here's some, here's some actual photographs taken by the Signal Corps. And on the back here, uh, you have to have permission for to copy them. This is taken uh, from the top uh, of Mount Tapacho, and it shows uh, our forces were up there by this time. That's why we got the picture. And uh, these are pineapple or uh, banana trees and uh, papaya trees. And here's a ship that sunk. And uh, this is one of the U.S. ships offshore. Now this is this will give you an idea what our our troops do. They didn't hurt the Japs. Didn't hurt Honolulu. But this is a uh, garapan after, after we bombarded it. So you can go through the town without somebody hiding in there and shooting at you. Mm -hmm. No, this is on Saipan? This is on Saipan. All these pictures are Saipan. Mm -hmm. okay. There's Mount Tapacho. And if you remember the picture, it was out here and Magazine Bay is here. Mm -hmm. These are uh, the 27th Division uh, uh, fighting 69th. Where uh, these are these are actual right down in the front uh, is where these are, and the front lines were up in here at that time, uh, with the rest of their unit. But this is at the end of the island the where they were securing it. The ammunition dump blew up. Oh, this is the one you hit. Yeah. 
I'll tell you a little about of that. That happened the first night we were there. And uh, uh, we had all of our airplanes in on the little airfield. And uh, the next morning, we wanted to shoot. And I couldn't raise the, uh, the uh, pilots down there. And uh, so I jumped in the Jeep and I went down to the airfield. I get down there and all the planes are upside down. They're laying, <laughs> laying on, the, on the ground, flipped over. And, uh, and the pilots are just sitting there. And I said, why didn't you call us? Uh, we didn't know where you were. Well, you got the radio in there. I said, that doesn't get it blowing up or anything. It just, and here's this big ammunition dump is exploding right about, about 300 yards from where we were. And, uh, but it was just a lot of small fire. That happened that night before. Here's some of the natives on the island, that, uh, the island natives, <coughs> that uh, they all get gathered into a room. This is our commanding officer, uh, the division commander, uh, General Smith. And he's given a, a Jap soldier on the, uh, airport at, Ten at Saipan, and uh, General Smith, Captain McCabe from the uh, 65th Regiment, Jap prisoner at Saipan, uh, and these are the hangers, Japanese hangers. Is it, did you get that? No, I got yes. that. Oh, let's see. This, is a pair, this picture appeared in all the newspapers back home. Of course, these are signature color pictures I've got here. Uh, I'll hold this tight. This is the way it looked at that airfield uh, uh, that you ju we just captured. Japanese prisoners of war. From the top of Mount Tapacho, Looking towards the end of the island, you can see where the front lines are, where the smoke is there. Mm -hmm. The Japanese smoking. And this was... Uh, the Fighting 69th just went through there. Those are all Japanese laying there. Did you get those? Yep, got them. Oh, let's see. No, that battle ended and they, they stopped. I'm going to give you this. And they, uh, there was no, no more action. That we, we, they cleaned up Saipan and that was it. So they're going to go to Tinian. And I got, I got this story out of this magazine from a neighbor of mine. I'm telling him about what I did on Tinian, see. And he said, I got an article at home. He says, he brought this magazine down and she said, I read it. And I was just uh, astounded because uh, it was word for word. When the Battle of Saipan finished, I was operations officer. I, hadn't, I didn't have to do this. I went down to the, our Piper Cup and I said, is there anyone here who will volunteer to take me over on the island of Tinian? It was still occupied by the Japanese. And one guy volunteered. So we flew over there and uh, I got the map of Tinian here. That's uh, Saipan. Oh, that's the battle lines on Saipan. Oh, they don't stand out very much. Yeah. You can see D plus. Uh... Okay, got it. Okay. Now, here's the island of Tinian. This is the island that I flew around before the, the Japs were on this island. And I got a scenario here. I'll give you these two copies here. Okay, I'm going to have to stop down. and change the tape.
So we had to fly across that water and, and, and down So Tinian is kind of to the south or uh, to the north of Saipan? Let's see, that was... Um, <coughs> I think they show in the north and south. Yeah, I'm not here. sure. I'm trying to remember from. <clears throat> okay, we have a new tape ready. It's in. Oh, okay. This is the Ion Atenian. Try to hold it still. Okay. I flew over here at a. Of course, I had a pilot's license before the war, mm -hmm. but I didn't continue it during the war. So I could tell the, uh, the pilot just exactly what I knew what he could do. So we were about 30 feet from the shore, 30 to 60 feet from the shore, and we were only about 10 feet in the air, and that's kind of hard, you know, flying uh, and keeping a level flight. So I started coming along, went along through here, and uh, I had the map that showed uh, where the, these beaches were. These beaches were uh, not beaches. They were uh, a lot of lava rock, and it was about three feet of, from, the water down, from the water up to the height there. And uh, not a very good beach to land on because you wouldn't, you'd have to be in the water. I'll, I'll tell you how they did it now in a minute. So then I flew down here to Tinian Town. And down at Tinian Town, it was fully mined. I looked down into the water. It was just solid with mines in there. I looked up in the hills, and there's a big camouflage net. The Japanese were ex experts on that. You couldn't tell from the top. And there was this British gun. It's about that big around, pointing right at us. <laughs> I'm in the Viper Cub. And I said to the pilot, I guess we're going to get blown out of the sky. And I turned around, and there's a Na U.S. Navy destroyer off, off a, about uh, a mile out offshore. So they didn't fire at us. <laughs> and uh, so we continued on around, oh, uh, around the island. You couldn't land anywhere else. It was too bad. Down here, with a beautiful beach, and uh, heavily defended. And I looked, at the, I looked in there, we're, the, all these Japs were standing there looking at us with their mouths hanging out. We were so close we could see them uh, at that point. And uh, they didn't fire a shot. And uh, <clears throat> so the pilot says, let's capture the island. We, I think <laughs> it was, was so cute, uh, so easy. So, so we went up and I said, there's an airfield right here, shown right here. Right here, there's an airfield. So uh, I says, there's a, uh, any aircraft gun at the end of the airfield. When you come, go up high and zoom down on it and go past it, see, uh, I want to see if it's knocked out. And they, I could even see that it was a sliding wedge breech block, and it was just creased with a, a, a burn more across so it was shot. So we swung around, he says, let's capture the island. And we go down and we land on the airstrip, and we're taxiing along, and a Jap came out to meet us on a bicycle. And uh, I said to the pilot, geez, we don't have a white flag, and he don't have a white flag, and maybe he thinks we're in trouble, and he'll take us in and interrogate us. Oh, let's not take a chance, I said to the pilot, uh, in capturing the island. I don't know to this day whether I could have captured the island or not. So I said, let's go back. So he said, okay, we went back. When I got back to our command post, I went to Colonel Taylor, my commanding officer. I told him the whole story. He says, write it all down and send it up to 5th Hib Corps, the uh, Marine Corps. So I wrote it all down and sent it up to them. And uh, they set up a landing program. Would you believe not a man got killed? And, and it was all because I had made this reconnaissance. They selected this lousy beach to land on. And they had a whole convoy in LCVs came from uh, Saipan down and went all the way down to Tinian Town like they were going to land in the town. And after they got down there, they radioed back and said, we're here. They had three pontoon bridges 
they carry, were towing. And they towed them into the shore, and the sea bees jumped out and tied them on the trees on the shore, these uh, floating dry docks. The Marines in the boats did an about face. They didn't come around like this. They had the, the uh, forces lined up backwards. And they pulled up alongside the dock. They had to warn them and get out of the boat, walk ashore. The Japs pulled out on this side, went down the island, and then a man was killed. And, and uh, they, went, they went down here, and all the Japs went down. This is real high ground down here, and they concentrated down here. The people in the town started, the, our Navy uh, leveled that town, of Tinian Town, and the people all got out of there. They were all up in the open, up behind it. And uh, the Japs went back in these high, the high ground. So uh, it took, oh, the, the second, uh, was it first or third? Or second or second or fourth, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, let's say here. Uh, it's so long ago, I don't remember. See, they, they second and fourth worked together, and the first and third worked together. I don't show it here with a landing force. But they uh, captured the island, and I didn't pay much attention to it, but afterwards, uh, they wrote that citation up, and uh, the, uh, flew, they flew me over to Saipan and pinned a medal on me in a, in a special plane, and uh, they told me to be go easy on writing up the uh, operation because the Marine Corps don't like the Army to get credit for something. <laughs> So I, 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 was, I was surprised that I was getting a, a, a medal for this. Now you'll find out what it says here. It says, uh, the, Marine, the U.S. Marine divisions with, that overwhelmed the Japanese defenders with what? Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, commander of the U.S. Navy 5th Fleet, called per, probably the most brilliantly conceived and executed amphibious operation of World War II. And I got a medal for it. <laughs> so it says over here in the next page, American reconnaissance showed that the southern beaches of Tinian Town and Oswego Bay were well defended with dozens of pillboxes and machine guns. Tinian's defenses were formidable. Oswego Bay alone had 23 pillboxes and numerous machine guns covering the beaches and their approaches. Reconnaissance all showed that the two small beaches near the northwest, of course it's in the north up there, mm -hmm. tip of the island weren't fortified. And that's where they landed. And I, I gave them the information. So the, the whole story, I didn't know this until about two years ago. And uh, I was telling a fellow down the street and he, he dug out the magazine, he says, well, you're all written up. I said, my name isn't in there, <laughs> but it's in the record. So uh, that was the, uh, Spruance said it was the uh, most outstanding uh, operation in the Pacific. And some of these things I can give you, I, I don't want to give you all. Okay, sure, we'll, we'll talk about that. Later. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give you these copies here of these pictures that uh, I made. You can have those. Let me see if I got any other others here. Here's one. These are copies of pictures I showed you. Mm -hmm. now, this is at a, a reunion we had in uh, Buffalo. Uh, all of these guys are dead but me. Uh, that's me. And uh, this was a JAG officer of the division, um, uh, Colonel McDonough. And this is uh, our chaplain of the division, Father Sadoti. And this uh, was uh, uh, Brainerd Smith, one of our officers. That was taken at a reunion in Buffalo. So how long ago? Oh, maybe eight or nine years ago. Now I'm, 
I don't want to go backwards. Uh, I'm talking about the island of Saipan. You remember I, I landed at uh, Macon Island? Mm -hmm. Well, here's a picture of Macon Island. See, this is now getting out of sequence. Hold the edge of that. This is where we landed here. These are where the beaches are, and our artillery was down here. And this is a lagoon out here. And of course, the, the direction of the uh, north, uh, I never did figure out whether, whether I was right or what was right, but we finally got it straightened out. Instead of me firing down here, I was out here with the shots. And all I did was just moved it over after I found out where they were. <laughs> uh, you can have that. Now here's, here's a bit of what it looks like when you're going ashore in a landing craft. It's the same beach, and uh, it shows here the markers uh, that you, the troops use when they're going in because there's all the trees, and uh, it's all rocks in here. It was very, uh, you had to pick and choose where you're going to bring them uh, in. Yuki, Yuki Angon Point it shows out there. Uh, that's down there, right. That's where we had our artillery. Mm -hmm. So that, you can have this here. At the Kwajalein operation, uh, one of our howitzers was loan, loaned to the Marine Corps, and uh, they had VTU f fuses that were defective. And uh, when they fired the shot, this, we loaned this gun to them for the Kwajalein operation, and it blew up inside the gun, defective fuse. So this shows a picture of the, uh, the gun afterwards. We didn't get that gun back. <laughs> and here's a picture of our artillery, uh, my regiment, uh, which became a battalion, 106 field artillery, firing there. I gave you one of these, didn't I? I don't think so. We could look through this when we're... Um, I'm not sure. I don't see it. Yeah, I got two here. You couldn't get to pick this up. Uh, this is a recent picture of the airfield at the end of Tinian and it shows Saipan in the, in the distance. I already showed you, I already showed yes. you these and I gave you those pictures. I made this thing up too. Were you uh, on this program? Uh, be. Robin Sh Sh Schimager, individual record officers and list of personnel in New York State military history. I wrote that up and I, I was going to send it to him. That's, that's our form, so he would have sent it in to us then. Yeah. Well, you can have that there. I, I, I wrote that all up. It's a long form. This is a picture. This is a map of Okinawa. Uh, we're going to go in, into that uh, also. Do you want to talk it, about that now that you have the map out, or, uh, or should I hold this map for you? It, 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 it's probably, probably hard to show it that it was jumping, uh, jumping around. Uh, uh, can you see yeah, that? I got it. Here's where we landed up in here. Third Marines, First Marines. Uh, 27th Division, 96th Division went in here. Uh, Shuri Castle, this is uh, Naha, the village here. They leveled that with the uh, Air Force and the Navy, and we swung around and come down the aisle this way. 
the commander on there, you hear of the story, uh, they, are, they are excellent uh, officers. If you, if you ever get a chance to get that book, uh, they, uh, they look back in the history, uh, back in the old, old days, with different commanders in Europe, mm -hmm. and they use their tactics and things. So when we landed there, we didn't have a shot fired at us. The Japanese didn't attack us. They let us land. And in Yohara's book, the reason they, they were in down in the ground and they played it cool. And they wanted to get everybody ashore in a group. If they fired at us landing, we'd turn around and run away. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they played it smart and stayed without uh, shooting at anything. Until we got, they got the whole force landed without uh, any... Uh, this is, that's the story I got mm -hmm. out of there. Uh, so when we were, were landing there, I was surprised that we weren't getting any opposition. And uh, everybody, we ran into the opposition after we were all fully there. They, they, uh, we had a lot of ships that were sunk. Uh, I, I was over towards the airfield when a Jap, the, the clouds were heavy and I remember a Jap plane revving up real, they, they, were, they knew he was up there, but they couldn't get uh, see him. He was up above the clouds, and all of a sudden I heard this, you know, he's coming down off of the end of the runway. And he went right down in a, a, uh, uh, not a, not a cruiser right near the bridge. Committed suicide, a suicide plane, right down in between them. Mm, big explosion. And uh, right over my head he came. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I got back to my outfit. Uh, we uh, ended up across the line there with a, the, the 27th Division was on the left. The 7th Division was on the right uh, of the uh, line. And uh, the 96th Division was in, in between. The line extended in around here. I, I, I can't read those. Uh, seventh Division was on this side. Yanabaru is down here. And the Japanese artillery were here. But they were in caves. And I kind of surmised there was something bad because I flew, I, I went up in a Piper Cub and went over there and you couldn't find any of the Japs or anything during the daytime. They're all in the caves. And uh, I see this, uh, uh, revetment, uh, like a ridge, and in front of it there was all fresh dirt. Oh gosh, it must have extended out a mile. They must have dug in there real heavy. That's where the artillery was, and they were supporting the uh, Japanese at Shuri Castle. The Japanese line ended up at Shuri. Where the heck is it on here? Here. That's a Shuri right there. And they were down, they were way down in the ground, 60 feet down there, and they they were over here at Yanar Peru with the artillery. So uh, it was on. I, I just believe it. I don't I don't remember the exact date. I think it was the 21st of May. Uh, the colonel put me on nights by myself, and a, and a telephone operator. And uh, it was around midnight that the uh, Japanese, it's in that book there. Right? I got more out of that book than I did out of our own stuff, <laughs> what their plans were and everything. Uh, they were planning at that time because of the monsoon filled the caves with water that they were down 65 feet and they couldn't stand it anymore. They had to come out. So uh, when they did, they planned a, a uh, strategic withdrawal. The infantry, uh, it would be backed up by their artillery, the regiment, the 7th Regiment they had. And so they start firing the shots from the 7th Regiment uh, sporadically. They didn't want, because they, their ammunition was slow, they couldn't have, they couldn't resupply it. And uh, so that's when I, I think I explained that before, didn't I? Yes. So uh, that's when I, I uh, I blew up their whole regiment. 
<laughs> they, they found, when they got up there, when the seventh got up there, they found some of the men leaning against a tree, still standing up, and they were dead. And uh, the smoke uh, shells uh, kept them from running around someplace because they couldn't see. And the uh, uh, fuse delay uh, causes a shell to go in the ground for uh, maybe a half a second and then come back out, ricochets back out, and it then it explodes about 10 feet above the ground. So you don't have to set a fuse or anything. Uh, using a fuse, uh, fuse delay, the shot comes in and it comes up like that, it then blows up. So it, it just spreads. Uh, so I had 5% of a uh, with fuse delay and 5% with white phosphorus. And they couldn't see where they were going or anything. It was, it must have been something, because the next, the next day they were coming back through the line saying uh, they wanted to see our machine gun artillery. <laughs> but that was, uh, I think that's the end of the battle. We, cause I got to go home pretty, uh, everything got, they start, uh, the Japanese pulled out and surrendered. It was a shame they uh, talked the people into uh, that they'd all be raped by the U.S. soldiers or they'd be killed anyway. Uh, and they went down and some of them jumped off the cliffs down there and committed suicide with some of the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yahara got himself into Japanese clothes. He didn't keep his uniform on. That's how he got out of it. And he, we could get this now, it's in there, in that book. He came to the United States before World War II and trained at some of our military installations. Why we sent people over there uh, on training missions mm -hmm. in Japan and places over there. And he was uh, in charge of the operation in uh, northern China uh, when the Japanese went into China there. And then they pulled him out to go into Okinawa. And they, they knew that they, everything was and going to end, and they wanted to get as many casualties on the U.S. as possible uh, because they knew our next move would be up to J into Japan. So they, the island of Tinian was very important because it was flat, and that's where they flew the Enola Gay and uh, what was the other one? The, uh, those uh, atomic bombs were flown from there. And that's when I didn't know those were out there. And the guys in the Air Force were taking bets the war's going to be over in another 10 minutes. <laughs> Bet you thousand dollars in that. <laughs> they knew that those bombs were going to be dropped. And, uh, what, what was your reaction when you heard about the bombs and their destruction? Uh, you mean uh, the uh, Hiroshima? Yes, Nagasaki. I was home at that time. You were? Yeah. And leave? Uh, I was on leave, yeah. I had 30-day mm -hmm. leave. Uh, That's right, you said that. Yeah. Um, what was your reaction to it? Well, uh, I, I had no idea we had a nuclear bomb. And I, I, I thought all my buddies were going to go in and invade Japan. Had they had everything all set up uh, for uh, invasion of Japan. Even the military, the army and everything was all set up. The, mm -hmm. Where the divisions were going to land, everything. And uh, I was very surprised. I thought they would uh, actually go into Japan. And when they dropped those two bombs, why? Uh, I, it just was like a, a calm set over. You. you figured that that's the end. Everything's good. Everything is coming to an end now. Yeah. Now, I, when were you? How long? Much longer did you stay in service? Well, I I never did get out. I I. Uh, uh, I went. I signed for the reserve mm -hmm. when I got out uh, the twenty, uh, the twenty-fifth of December, nineteen forty-five, and uh, I immediately signed up for the reserve. I didn't want to break my uh, service, and I came back. And uh, I think it was. Uh, it's probably in my notes there. Uh, I talked to Colonel Flanagan. Called me, Colonel Flanagan. He said, we're going to re-institute uh, the 27th Division in New York State. And I'd like to have you come up and help us. I said, I don't want anything to do with the Army anymore. <laughs> I had enough. And he says, I'll tell you what, we'll give you a promotion. So uh, 
he prom I came out as a captain. You could, this is one thing I didn't like about the whole d war. We went from 149,000 men when I first started to 6,000. And they kept us together so we couldn't get promoted. We couldn't be promoted because the, of the TONE wouldn't allow you to over, over staff. So they kept us as a unit and, and it prevented us from going ahead in our, our life. And even though you, you accomplished everything, they didn't break up the units. So uh, they reorganized the 27th and uh, he, when I came back, I, I went in back into the 106th as a major and then I almost overnight I got a promotion to a lieutenant colonel. And I went on to be uh, nominated as an uh, adjutant general for the 27th division. And I, uh, I was inspector general also. I had a lot of work to do with that. And uh, I retired as a lieutenant colonel, but they gave me a full colonel on retirement after I'd retired. So, uh, so when, what year did you retire? 1965. Mm -hmm. 35 years of service. An officer can't spend any more time than that. And, uh, unless you're a general. Mm -hmm. I guess they get a few more years. Well, I hope I didn't bore you. No. Um, how do you think the military affected your life? You spent a good part of it in it. Uh, what did you say about your experiences? I think, I think that what I learned through the whole thing, uh, I would do it over again. It was an education that, uh, whether anybody believes that or not, it was an education to me. I learned an awful lot about it. It was too bad that I couldn't have moved up because I would have made a lot of changes in the war. That was, they expanded so fast, they had too many men, inexperienced and, uh, and running units, and uh, too many lives lost. Uh, as I said here, what Spruan said, you know the Navy and the Marines didn't go along. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Uh, because the Navy, is a subject to being attacked in their ships. And they want, they push the Marines to get their operation over as fast as possible. So they're not sitting ducks around there with all their ships. And uh, there was some friction between them, but they, they did work together. Uh, the, uh, but that's why my CO, when, I, when he wrote up my citation, he didn't want to, uh, agitate the Marines or anybody, so he kind of made it kind of smooth. Even though what I accomplished, they, uh, they may not have done what they uh, did. They, they only gave me a bronze star for uh, uh, an, an operation that turned out to be the best in the Pacific. You know? But uh, the background that I had uh, was wasted because I, I could have put that to good use if I was a higher commander. Uh, I was much more experienced in education and the schools I went to. I, I graduated from the Commander General Staff College, the uh, Field Artillery School of Fort Sill, the uh, uh, Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and I went to a uh, jungle training school, and I went to uh, a lot of uh, operations uh, with the Marines and the military loading and unloading ships. Uh, those schools that I went to in, in preparation over in, uh, t uh, in, in Hawaii. So uh, I had quite a bit of an uh, educational background. Do you think the, it's because you stayed in the field artillery and there wasn't a lot of advancement in that branch? Uh, uh, well, I wasn't in the infantry. I mightn't be here today. Mm -hmm. Those those boys were, uh, it's, they lost an awful lot of men in the infantry. I was fortunate I, I was in the artillery from the beginning and right through. Uh, it, 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 it just bothered me when I see the lives that were lost taking those islands, which, which wasn't necessary. 
uh, the Army and the, and the Marine Corps operations were different. They're not today. They're much better. Uh, their tactics are much better today than they were then. Okay. What did you do after you uh, left the service? Well, I went back at the steel plant. Okay. Yeah, I was a supervisor over there. And they moved me around quite a bit. Uh, a lot of jobs. I was uh, I was scheduled to go down to the uh, to their main office in, in Benson, Pennsylvania, uh, and and moved up in line. And my wife didn't want to move, so uh, that's when you. You, you, you level off and you don't go any higher. <laughs> so uh, I, oh. felt, I felt I was away too much and I, and I had to spend it with my family. Mm -hmm. What year did you get married? I know you uh, said. Uh, 1941. 41. Yeah, in October, mm -hmm. uh, just before the war broke out. Mm -hmm. How many children do you have? I had five. Yeah, and one of them uh, uh, got to be a major in the National Guard. He's, he lives in Syracuse. Uh, I got a son who's out in uh, Colorado. He has his own business. He went to, through college. Uh, and he, uh, he's worth a fortune. He, uh, he owns a big construction company. And he told me he would never build any houses because he says that women can't make up their mind what they want. They got too many changes. He says when they when you have a business send you a set of plans, that's it. It's already set. That's what you just sit down and do it. So he says uh, I stayed with the business and uh, he bought a lot of land and he put up what's that outfit in California that uh, the computer uh, chips? Uh, Silicon Valley? Well, no, with the, the company? Yeah. Uh, it's a big, co great big company. Not Microsoft. Microsoft. Is it? They, they built two big office buildings. He built two big office buildings in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Mm -hmm. They moved out of California, you know, mm -hmm. and they're in Colorado. Everybody's leaving uh, California for some reason. I thought they were just leaving New York. <laughs> yeah. So Is he, there any other story or anything you want to relate before we're finished? Do you think you told us everything? Uh, I think I have told you everything. I probably you, think. Pardon? Were you with the Twenty uh, Seventh Division when General Smith was relieved? Yes. Yes. What did you think of that? I think it was a sad case. Uh, General Howells, Mad Smith. Uh, uh, that that was a uh, General Smith of the Army. The Army has their own way of doing things, and unfortunately. Alan Mad Smith was the commander of the overall operations, so he had to do it his way. Well, uh, General Smith of the Army didn't want to do it his way. He didn't want to uh, uh, go through the way the the Marines were doing it, and he relieved him. Uh, but he shouldn't. Uh, the, it, that shouldn't have ever happened uh, because Smith of the Army had more knowledge of operation and handling men than. Uh, I don't think that Holland Mad Smith commanded anything larger than a, uh, a regiment until that operation came along, and then he was in charge of the whole operation. Uh, it was a sad thing that happened. Yeah. Any other questions? Did you did you uh, uh, serve under General Greiner? Yep. Yeah. What, what was your impression of him? Uh, very well. He, he was very good. He, uh, well, I was under. I wasn't directly under him then. He was on the, the island of Saipan when they, the relief came in, and uh, I was already at the with Twenty Fourth Corps. But I would. I had enough connection with all of the people in the Twenty Seventh uh, before I went to Twenty Fourth Corps, uh, and I. Uh, I was. I, I had an opportunity to see his a way of running things, uh, mm -hmm. in, in compared to uh, General Smith. So he did. He was very excellent in his running the uh, 27th Division. It's unfortunate that this 
act problem uh, occurred. Uh, the uh, any other questions? Uh, I was just going to mention uh, the the bonsai attack. Oh yes, sir. That uh, the 105th Infantry were on a. Uh, Oh, what was the side pen map? I think I may have it here. Okay. Let me see now. Sharon Canola. This Mount Tapajo. Uh, the 105th Infantry had this little sector in here uh, and the J full Japanese force came down this side of the island and they had their co command post up here and uh, incidentally I blew up the ammunition dump up there in the first of the operation and I hit their uh, some guns that they had when I uh, went up on the plane to re register where we first got there but they came down here in mass uh, with their bayonets on their rifles, and uh, they just went through. The 105th held them, and they they just uh, lost an awful lot of men because they, they didn't care whether they died or not. The Japanese did, and they just kept on coming no matter how many bullets you, you had. And uh, Lieutenant Trippy, the guy that was uh, on Macon Island with me, they found his body and his pistol still in his hand and no bullets left in his gun. He was over there as a uh, foreign observer for the 106th Field Artillery at that time. And uh, he lost his life uh, when the Japanese made this attack in here, the bonsai attack. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, sir. Uh,